Welcome to yet again another class on embryology. In this particular class of embryology, we are going to talk about development and congenital malformations of the lower respiratory system. We will focus on the lower respiratory system largely because the development and malformations of the upper respiratory system referring to the nose and the pharynx is largely done under development of head and neck series where you talk about the pharyngeal apparatus. So that has already been covered in that lecture on pharyngeal apparatus. And that is why in this particular one, we focus on the lower respiratory tree. The learning outcomes for this lecture, the following one, the yolk sac is an important structure in the development of the respiratory system and digestive system. And for that reason, we'll start way back from there. When the embryo falls, it has some impact on the yolk sac and that becomes important in what you're going to discuss. So our first agenda will be to explain the process of embryonic folding and state the impact of embryonic folding on the yolk sac. That will lead us to the formation of something we call the primordial gut tube. Our second agenda will then be to talk about the embryonic origins of the lower respiratory system. And here we're going to talk about the site of origin as well as the tissues of origin. And when we talk of tissues of origin, we're talking about the germ layers that give rise to lower respiratory tree. After that, we are going to talk about the process of septation of the embryonic foregut. That primordial gut tube that I've talked about has three parts, foregut, midgut, and hindgut. And that foregut is the one that is responsible for giving us parts of the respiratory system that we want to talk about. So there's need for that foregut to be separated so that we separate what is digestive from what is respiratory. So that agenda focuses on how that foregut become split into those two systems. After that, we'll talk about how the larynx develop and we'll match that with how the trachea develops. And then we'll talk about the stages of fetal lung development. The understanding here is that the lung develops prenatally, but also postnatally. So the prenatal stages of lung development define some morphological phases of lung development and maturation that we'll be talking about. Then we'll talk about some congenital malformations that affect the respiratory system. We may not limit ourselves, however, to the lung tissue itself there. We can also talk about those ones that affect even the upper respiratory system and even the vascular tree within the respiratory system. So basically that is our agenda. So let's start with the process of embryonic folding and see the impact it has on the yolk sac. You are probably already aware about this particular image. I've given you this in another lecture in the basic embryology series, basically. So to your left, I'll play a video for you that shows you how the embryo falls in the transverse axis. So you follow the video. Remember the blue region is the amniotic cavity and so the yellow part is the yolk sac. This is ectoderm, mesoderm and endoderm. Right now, new relation is taking place. You can see the parts of the mesoderm, the three parts paraxial intermediate and lateral plate mesoderm. Now look at what is happening to the yolk sac as the embryo is folding. The baby is becoming rounded, cylindrical. Some part of the yolk sac has been incorporated into the embryo there. Also look at these regions here. They were not there, but now they're there, the intraembryonic coelom. Not the whole of the yolk sac is incorporated. Some part of the yolk sac remain outside. And the connection between the two is what we call the vitelline duct. Let's see a similar thing in the sagittal plane. 
So in the sagittal plane, if this is the chorionic cavity, that is a meiotic cavity, and this is yolk sac, that's the allantois, that's the connecting stalk. This is where the heart begins to form initially. That's the brain. In the craniocaudal axis, we are going to see how that folding occurs and it's now being shown. So progressively, you can see that there's the dorsal part of the yolk sac, which is being incorporated into the embryo while the ventral part of the yolk sac is remaining outside here. The connection between the two, which is called the yolk stock there, is the vitelline duct. So that is folding in the craniocaudal axis. Let's put that in words, maybe. So I've demonstrated to you that the embryo falls in two axes. There's a longitudinal axis, which is also called the craniocardial axis or the sagittal axis, or sagittal folding. And there's what we call the transverse folding or the lateral folding. As the embryo falls, the dorsal part of the yolk sac become incorporated in the embryo progressively. And that dorsal part of the yolk sac that become incorporated in the embryo progressively becomes the primordial gut. So we call the primordial gut tube. The ventral part of the yolk sac is not incorporated. That ventral part will involute. Initially, it becomes the vital duct, which will disappear. Now that primordial gut tube is the primitive alimentary canal. This is the one that will become the alimentary canal. Right now, it's just one highway fine that will become the primitive alimentary. It will become the alimentary canal. We divide the parts of the primordial gut tube into three. We have what you call the foregut, midgut, and the hindgut. Let me show you that one in this image of the sagittal folding. So if that is a meiotic cavity and this is yolk sac, you can follow that. On the last one, then we see, okay, let me start the first one here. The dorsal part of the yolk sac is that one, which become progressively be incorporated in the embryo. And so it's here. That dorsal part is the primordial gut tube. The primordial gut tube has three segments. The region near the head is called the foregut. The region attached to the allantois is called the hindgut. And the region connected to the vitelline duct is called the midgut. So we have a foregut, a midgut, and a hindgut. Let's talk about what each of those segments of the primordial gut give rise to. So the foregut is from the cranial end. I've told you that the primordial gut gives you the alimentary canal. So which part of the alimentary canal come from where? The foregut represents the region of the alimentary canal from the pharynx all the way down to the duodenum, which will be corresponding around somewhere there at the level of the duodenum. When you look at lecture on the embryology of the digestive system, we'll put more details into that statement and be saying which part of the duodenum, things like that. For now, let's just say that the foregut extends from the pharynx all the way to the duodenum. Midgut, on the, okay, so this image shows you that all the way to that region that is foregut, which is up to the level of the duodenum there. Midgut, extend from the duodenum all the way to the transverse column. So the whole of that is a mid gut up to somewhere there. And by the time we're reaching there, that will be corresponding with the level of the transverse column. And then hind gut begin from the level of the transverse column all the way down to the anus. Initially, there's a common structure which is called the cloaca but that will be partitioned as well. So we'll 
can confidently talk about the anus. You notice that uh, the duodenum and the transverse colon are partly in the foregut and partly in the midgut. Okay, let me put that in a different way. The duodenum is partly in the foregut and the midgut, while the transverse colon is partly in the midgut and the hindgut. We'll put more statement to that when you look at development of the digestive system. For now, I want you to understand that there is what we call the foregut, which gives you the upper part of the alimentary canal. In terms of the germ layers that are around the yolk sac, at the time that this yolk sac is going to fold, I want us to talk about that because that's also going to be important in understanding the tissue origins of the digestive system as well as tissue origins of the respiratory system. So let me take you back to the second week of development where we have a structure called AP blast and hypoblast, we call that the bilamina embryo. You remember that the cells of the hypoblast are the ones that actually extend to cover the primary yolk sac. And so the yolk sac is initially lined by the cells of the hypoblast. That is way back in the second week of development. However, when the process of gastrulation take place, we form the trilamina embryo instead of the bilamina embryo. The story changes so that now the yolk sac will now be lined by endoderm instead of hypoblast. So yes, initially the yolk sac is lined by hypoblast cells, but subsequently the endodermal cells are the ones that line the yolk sac. That yellow thing represents the endoderm lining the yolk sac in the third week of development. As you can see in that image there, you have the trilamina embryo. And subsequently, as the embryo falls, we see that it is still the endoderm that is inside the yolk sac. Important to note is that as development goes on and the embryo falls, the Mesoderm divides into the various parts, paraxial, intermediate, and lateral plate. And that lateral plate divides into two, somatic and splanc nuclear. Important to note, the splanc nuclear is intimate with the endoderm. So we can say that the endoderm that is lining the yolk is covered, is surrounded by the splanc nuclear of the lateral plate mesoderm. Again, that statement is going to be important in you understanding the embryonic origins of digestive and respiratory systems. And so look at this image here showing you transverse folding. If this is the somatic layer of the lateral plate mesoderm, and this is planktonic layer of the lateral plate mesoderm, we're going to see, according to those arrows, how transverse folding takes place so that there'll be a cavity here which we call the intraembryonic cavity. But then also we are going to have that layer, which are called this planknic layer of the lateral plate mesoderm and the somatic layer. Importantly, I want you to follow that to the last image. And we notice that when you form the primordial gut tube, that one, the inner layer is endodermal, as you can see there. And the outer layer is splanchnic mesoderm. So two tissues form the wall of the primordial gut. Inside we have the endoderm and outside we have this splanchnic layer of the lateral plate mesoderm. That is our agenda number one regarding the yolk sac and how the embryo falls and the impact that the folding has on the yolk sac. I hope you do remember the tissue walls that form the wall of the primordial gut tube, endoderm inside and splanchnic mesoderm outside. Having said so, let's now talk about embryonic origins of the lower respiratory tree. Generally, when you're asked to talk about embryonic origin of a structure, there's some two concepts that need to come out. 
First is the site of origin and two, the tissues of origin. So those aspects of origin of an organ or a structure needed to come out very clear. The site of origin and the tissues of origin. Regarding the tissues, we just want to highlight on the germ layers. So let's fill that gap regarding the lower respiratory tree. And we start with the site of origin. The lower respiratory tree arise from a ventromedial diverticulum, which usually form in the foregut. So in the anterior aspect of the foregut, that's where you have that ventromedial diverticulum. That ventromedial diverticulum is known as the laryngotracheal groove, which become what we call the respiratory diverticulum. So what the site? The site is the anterior foregut, the ventral foregut. That's the embryonic site of origin. Yes, from the ventral aspect of the foregut, there's a structure that forms. And that structure that forms is called the laryngotracheal groove. It's a diverticulum from the ventral foregut. That diverticulum, it's going to elongate slightly to become what we call the respiratory diverticulum. Well, some books will still use them interchangeably. So even me, I can still use that interchangeably. The laryngotracheal groove and the respiratory diverticulum can be used interchangeably. But uh, the understanding is that the groove appears first, then slight elongation gives you what we call the respiratory diverticulum. So that site of origin of the lower respiratory tree corresponds with the level that is going to give you the pharynx and esophagus. Remember, it's the foregut. So that region that's going to give you pharynx and esophagus, that junction there is around where the laryngotracheal groove actually forms. So we've pinpointed the site of origin of the lower respiratory tree. Now let's pinpoint the tissues of origin of the lower respiratory tree. Having said that it's actually from the foregut and that the foregut has those two embryonic layers, endoderm inside and splanctic mesoderm outside. It is therefore not surprising that those are the key tissues that contribute to the formation of the respiratory tree. The endoderm of the foregut gives rise or will give rise to the epithelial lining as well as glandular tissues of the respiratory tree. So think about what you're calling the epithelial lining. Remember the respiratory epithelium itself Remember the cell types of the alveoli. Those are epithelial linings, basically. They come from the endoderm of the foregut. On the other hand, the splanctic mesoderm that is around the foregut is the one that will form the various connective tissue elements as well as smooth musculature within the respiratory tree. So again, think about that things like the tracheal cartilages, things like the lamina propria, the submucosa, trachealis muscle, the smooth muscle of the bronchi and the bronchioles, all those come from the splanchnic mesoderm. However, neurocrest cells also contribute the neurocrest cells usually migrate and invade the developing gut tube. And so the extensions contribute to formation of the nerve plexus within those regions. Now that we're talking about the respiratory tree, remember supplied by autonomic nerve plexus. So the nerve plexuses within respiratory tree come from neurocrest cells. However, in the upper parts of the respiratory tree, like around the larynx, 
Remember, laryngeal structures, some laryngeal structures come from pharyngeal apparatus. And important, the sixth pharyngeal arc is very important in contributing to some laryngeal skeleton. In that note, therefore, remember, neurocrest is usually one of the key contributors of the mesenchyme of the head and neck region. And so in as much as the cartilages of the larynx come from mesenchymal tissue, that mesenchymal tissue is most likely of neurocrest origin as opposed to being of the mesoderm origin. So that's the role of neurocrest, largely on the upper parts, the upper parts of the respiratory tree. So we think about the laryngeal region upwards, that's where they contribute to mesenchyme. Great, so that addresses the second agenda regarding the tissues of origin of the respiratory tree. So we made, we've made one important statement that this structure we are calling the foregut gives rise to respiratory tree, but it also gives rise to the digestive system. If we are to put that in a very plain way, that the foregut gives you two systems, the respiratory tree, as well as the digestive system. Therefore, it is very important that we split the foregut to distinguish between what is respiratory and what is digestive. And that is why that third agenda is on the slide. Let's talk about foregut septation. The purpose of foregut septation is basically to partition the embryonic foregut into two structures. The ventral aspect of it will be the respiratory tree. The structure we're going to get from that is known as the laryngotracheal tube because it's going to form the larynx and the trachea at that level. The dorsal part of it should be the digestive system. And the structure we're going to get at that level is basically the esophagus. So in simple terms, fog acceptation aim at splitting the trachea in front and the esophagus behind. That's the purpose. And this image shows you that process, but let's talk about it in the next slide. So let's talk about the process of fog acceptation. First, once the respiratory diverticulum has appeared in front of the embryonic foregut, which is the yellow one, some ridges appear. These ridges are bilateral and they appear in the coronal plane, as you can see. You see, this is a, a lateral view and that's why they're in that plane, but this is an AP view. And so you can see that in the coronal plane. There's some ridges that appear between the foregut that is remaining and the respiratory diverticulum that has been formed. Those ridges appear from below as they grow upwards. We call those ridges the tracheosophageal ridges. So those two ridges, that and that, grow towards each other and actually fuse. Look at this one. So we are following on that being the foregut with endoderm inside and splanchic mesoderm outside, and that being the respiratory diverticulum. So at three levels, or rather at three time differences, we are seeing what's happening. At this earlier event, we see the tracheoesophageal ridge or fold, the right and the left one. And this second image, we're seeing that the two come and actually approach one another and make contact, they fuse, and we see their complete separation. So the right and the left tracheoesophageal ridge grow towards each other and fuse to form the tracheoesophageal septum 
eventually that septum becomes split so that we actually have separation between the trachea in front and the esophagus behind. The separation of the trachea and the esophagus is usually completed by the sixth week of gestation. Right, now let's put some meat into the statement that the laryngotracheal tube is in front and it's giving you the larynx and the trachea. After the septation has taken place, the laryngotracheal tube undergoes elongation. So elongation is an important process that the laryngotracheal tube undergoes. After it has elongated, and look at that image, that is the laryngotracheal tube, which is that one and that one. And in this one, we see elongation. After the elongation has occurred, there are some two structures that appear on the lower end of the laryngotracheal tube. Those two outpouchings are known as lung buds or bronchial buds. Well, they could slightly mean a different thing, but the time zone for that difference is very narrow. And so I prefer just using them interchangeably. Call them lung buds or bronchial buds. So they develop bilaterally, one right and one left. So we have the right bronchial bud and the left bronchial bud at the lower end of the laryngotracheal tube. When septation of the foregut is taking place, I told you that the septation is occurring from below going up. Usually, the laryngotracheal tube is not completely separated from the foregut, and we expect that that is, should be true. We don't need complete separation between the laryngotracheal tube and the foregut where it came from. So that proximal communication that the laryngotracheal tube has with the primitive pharynx of the foregut is actually where the larynx will be coming from. That communication actually forms the laryngeal orifice. So that's where the larynx come from. The cartilages of the larynx and the musculature of the larynx develop from the mesenchyme of the sixth pharyngeal arch predominantly. And you've already talked about the pharyngeal arches, so I'll not talk much about that one. Predominantly from the sixth arch, there could be some slight contribution from the fourth arch, but uh, most of them are from the sixth arch. Now, usually, having mentioned that endoderm is inside, and splanctic mesoderm is outside. The endodermal tissue, which represents epithelium, appears to grow very fast, faster proliferation compared to mesodermal tissue. With that in mind, if you have a tubular structure like that and endoderm is inside and it's growing fast, the implication is that that endoderm can grow very fast to even obliterate the lumen of the gut tube. And that indeed takes place. That there is some temporary luminal occlusion. That period of luminal occlusion is known as the solid stage of development. And it's caused by rapid proliferation of the endoderm compared to mesoderm. So the lumen obliterates. Having said so, you know that respiratory system is a luminous structure, basically. And so we need recanalization to take place. Recanalization, therefore, must occur so that the respiratory tree reestablishes a lumen. This concept of solid stage of development is not unique to the respiratory system only. It also appears to happen even in the digestive system, and even other systems that have endoderm inside and mesoderm outside. Endoderm grows rapidly. And so it's not a unique thing for respiratory system. 
And so don't limit yourself to that one only. It happens even in the digestive system and the others. Anyway, concept is if you have a solid stage of development, you must have a recanalization phase. So recanalization occurs by formation of small cavities, which we call vacuoles, and these vacuoles unite so that you can form a lumen, and that process occurs largely by apoptosis. All right, now we've talked about the larynx. We've talked about the trachea. Remember the trachea was just an elongation. And so from the solid stage, we have recanalization. But remember the lower end of the laryngotracheal tube had two outpouchings, the right and the left lung bud, or the right and the left bronchial buds. It is from there that we're going to pick as we talk about development of the lungs. Lung development appears to take place in multiple stages. Now we have morphological stages of development in terms of activities that take place, but we also have periods in terms of timing. And I'll give you both. Let's start with the periods, then we put it into perspective, and then we talk about the morphological stages because the morphological stages is the one that uh, we largely ask you in anatomy, and it's the one that's actually more of anatomy. But let's put the periods into perspective. So lungs develop in three periods. There's the embryonic period of development. And remember, embryonic period of development refers to the first few weeks up to week seven, week eight there. And then we have the fetal period of development. Fetal period of development extends from week nine until birth. And then lungs develop also postnatally. So in terms of periods of development, we have those three. There are those that take place during the embryonic period. There are those that take place during the fetal period of development and the those which will take place after delivery of the baby. So that is regarding the periods. But let's put into perspective regarding the morphological phases. The image shown here captures for you the morphological phases. Again, we talk about five morphological phases. We have the embryonic phase, coincidentally the same as that one. Pseudoglandular phase, canalicular phase, circular phase, and alveolar phase. Now, these four fall within the fetal period. However, the last one, alveolar, spill over to the postnatal phase. So that in the postnatal phase, we are still talking about the alveolar stage of development. In the postnatal period, we are still talking about the alveolar phase of development. But this three, these four, they are all captured within the fetal period of development. I hope that helps in you understanding the timing. I want us to talk about those morphological phases. Let's start with the embryonic stage of lung development. So this is basically before the eighth week of gestation. During that period, this is what happens. As with regard to development of the lungs, first, it is a period that the respiratory diverticulum will form what we call the laryngotracheal groove. And if it forms, it is also the period that the septation of the foregut takes place. I've told you that foregut septation to give you trachea and esophagus is usually complete by the sixth week. So these events are taking place during the embryonic phase. The formation of the right and the left bronchial bud also occur during this particular period. So you have the right and the left bronchial bud 
or the right and the left lung bud as shown in this particular image. That also happened during this period. Remember, the right and the left bronchial bud actually correspond with the first generation of airway division. And the first generation of airway division is what you're calling the main stem bronchi or the principal bronchi or the primary bronchi, it's just main bronchi. So the right main bronchus and the left main bronchus. That is what they correspond to. At that time, the blood vessels associated with the bronchi also form at that time. And those blood vessels will therefore correspond with the main pulmonary vessels. Well, having the main one, which come from the heart and divides into the right and left one. They also formed during that particular stage of development. So that's the embryonic stage of development and the things which form during that stage of development. After that, we go to the fetal stages. And the first fetal stage we start with is the pseudoglandular stage of development. What happens in the pseudoglandular stage? Look, so that is a tracker that has already been formed in the embryonic stage. And there were two lung buds which were on the lower end of the tracker. In the pseudoglandular stage, we are going to have branching, and let me call it extensive and continuous branching of the airways, all the way from the second generation to the 16th generation of airway division. Second generation, all the way to the 16th generation of airway division. Those ones mark the events that take place during the pseudoglandular stage. It's a period of airway branching. Remember the 16th generation of airway division is what we call the terminal bronchial. And that terminal bronchial marks the end of the conducting zone. So if you are to put that in a different way, during the pseudoglandular phase of lung development, we have formation of the remaining components of the conducting zone. Yes, the nasal cavity, the pharynx, the larynx, and the trachea, and perhaps the primary bronchi have already been formed during the embryonic stage of development. Now in the pseudoglandular stage of development, the rest of the conducting zone are actually formed. The blood vessels that accompany those conducting zones also form during that particular time. And the concept of blood vessels is important to highlight because they usually go together. As pseudoglandular stage is taking place, the pseudoglandular stage is predominantly a solid stage because of what I told you earlier, the endoderm that is inside is more aggressive than the mesoderm that is outside. And for that reason, therefore, that we are going to have solidification. Even though we have branching of the airways, these airways do not have a lumen. That's my point. They are blocked. That then brings me to the next phase of lung development. We're going to talk about it sh shortly. But let's see, this image is captured for us, the pseudoglandular phase of development. We see first the bronchial bud. So you are aware that the right main stem bronchus gives you three secondary, and that is what we're seeing there. Remember, however, that um, in the right side, the bronchus, this blubber bronchus that goes to the upper lobe is usually given first. And then you have an intermediate, which you call the bronchus intermedius, which then gives you the one that goes to the middle lobe and the one that goes to the lower lobe of the right lung. On the left, they're just two, no big deal. 
So as the days go by there, we see continuous branching and let's just understand that uh, we have branching up to the terminal bronchial. Now let's put perspective into that. Remember, we started from somewhere there, York Sac became incorporated and formed the primordial gut tube. And this primordial gut tube has endoderm inside and splactic mesoderm outside. But external to that, we see the intraembryonic cavity, which is the space between the splactic mesoderm and somatic mesoderm. We are saying that uh, in the ventral aspect of the foregut, there's a diverticulum. So it's an outgrowth. Ask yourself, into which space is that outgrowth actually growing into? And the answer will be simple. That outgrowth is actually growing into this space here. It is growing into the intraembryonic cavity. It is growing into the intraembryonic cilum. It doesn't penetrate it, but the cilum provides space for expansion. And perhaps this one captures that. It will just be growing, and so it will just be pushing the splanctic layer rather than penetrating it, as you can see in this particular image. With that in mind, therefore, I want you to understand that because of that, we see that the intraembryonic cilum is actually the future pleural cavity. It's the one that's going to form the pleural cavity. And so if the intraembryonic cilum forms the pleural cavity, what are the embryonic sources of the pleura then? Remember we have the paratopleura and the visceral pleura. The paratopleura come from the somatic layer of the lateral plate mesoderm. This is the one that's going to give you the paratopleura. The visceral pleura come from the splanchnic layer of the lateral plate mesoderm. So the pleura has dual embryonic origin. You can look at it that way, based on those two layers. The splanchnic mesoderm giving you the visceral pleura and the somatic mesoderm giving you the paratopleura. The space between the two is a pleural cavity. So point is, lung grows into the intraembryonic cilum and so the cilum becomes the pleura eventually. At this point, that space has not been partitioned yet. And that is why you can see it having those very funny names for now you are taking into consideration that the heart will also derive its cavity from there. Also the intestine will also derive their cavity from there. So it's a continuous long cavity, but it will undergo separation. After pseudoglandular stage of development, we have the canalicular stage of development. Reason being during the pseudoglandular stage, it's largely a solid stage. So we need a time period when the airway can actually undergo canalization. So the canalicular stage of development is a period of airway canalization. It is during this period, again, that we also form the other components of the airways. Remember, Pseudoglandular stage ended at what point? Generation 16, terminal bronchial. Now the other generations, generation 17 to 19 predominantly are actually formed during the canalicular stage. A bit of the alveolar duct also formed here, but largely the respiratory bronchioles, which is generation 17 to 19, are the ones which are largely formed during the canalicular stage of lung development. And we usually call those ones the intermediate phases. The blood vessels that accompany those ones are also formed during that stage. Always remember 
the concept of the blood vessels accompany. So in this image, that region there correspond with the canalicular stage of development. And if you wish, you can be just looking at the time lapse there, the time scale on the lower margin there, you can see the embryonic phase covered uh, up to week seven there, then pseudoglandular period from week seven to week 17, or roughly around there, not cast on stone, but again, um, we're not talking about variants of more than a week. So usually some books will give you a 16 or an 18, but it's okay, that is still within range. Canalicular stage is from week 17 to week 26 of gestation as we can see in that particular image. Now, importantly, even as the airway is canalized, the epithelial lining that line the airways are largely cuboidal epithelium as opposed to squamous epithelium. That is important to note because when you re remember the histological organization of the respiratory system, the cuboidal cells are largely the type two cells. The squamous cells are the type one cells. So we are saying that during the canalicular stage, we already have the type two cells. That means that they can actually begin to form surfactant. The surfactant that they're forming at this point may not be so much, and it may also not be very mature biochemically, but yes, they can begin to form surfactant. So surfactant production, begin around that time during the canalicular stage of lung development that's when surfactant production begins why because the cuboidal cells are already present after that we have the circular stage of lung development now i want you to look at the first image and notice that yes we have an airway that has a lumen from the canalicular stage. But what is unique about the epithelial lining? Largely cuboidal epithelium. That is what we have at the end of the canalicular stage. And in terms of how far we've gone, remember the terminal bronchial was where it ended after pseudoglandular stage. And then these ones, generation 17 to 19 are actually respiratory bronchioles, which form during the canalicular stage. In the terminal sac stage, what happened is that we have ballooning of the terminal ends of the airways. We are ballooning of those respiratory bronchioles, the balloon out. The ballooning here is about expanding the aluminum without necessarily increasing so much about the number of cells. What is the impact of that? The impact is that now the cells are going to flatten out because you're stretching them. In simple terms, I'm saying that the epithelium, some epithelial cells become squamous. And if you have to say that in a different way, then it means you have introduction of pneumocyte type one cells. So initially we had just the type two cells, cuboidal. Now we also have the type one pneumocytes. Because this ballooning occurs at the end of these airways, sometimes you also call it the terminal sac stage. The sacs appear at the end of the airways. And because of the thinning of the epithelium, we say therefore that the type one cells appear. If you have type one cells appearing and they make contact with the blood vessels as you can see there. In the first image, we don't see so much contact with the, between the epithelium of the lung and those of the blood vessels. But in the second image, we see contact between the epithelium of the lung and uh, that of the blood vessel. And so that contact is what we call the primitive air blood barrier, the primitive respiratory membrane. We have establishment of the primitive respiratory membrane. It's still primitive, not so efficient in gas exchange, and there's no gas exchange 
Anyway, maybe the membrane is still very thick. And so it has to be thinned out in the subsequent phases. That is circular stage of development. Now, as we're talking about circular stage of development, remember that uh, in the canalicular stage, we had formation of the respiratory bronchioles from generation 17 to 19. A bit of the alveolar duct also formed during that stage. However, during the circular stage, that is when we have formation of more alveolar ducts. So more alveolar ducts form during the circular stage. Also, a good number of alveolar sacs also appear during the circular stage of lung development. Remember, surfactant production began during the canalicular phase. So in the circular stage, we still have continuous surfactant production. Usually because of the presence of the alveoli, or rather the alveolar sacs which are present, because of that one, if a baby is born at this particular time, and especially the latter stages of this particular period, there is some ability of survival for the infant. The infant can actually survive because the baby is now able to breathe. Just exchange can be managed. It can happen. But there's a problem. The amount of surfactant that has been produced is still not so much, and a lot of it is not really mature. For that reason, if a baby is born during this time, in as much as they can survive, they may need some support. The lungs are not really fully opening up. And so because of the inadequate surfactant, and so they may need some support. If they're born at this time, they may get what we call respiratory distress syndrome of the newborn. But yes, the baby will be alive. Unlike if the baby is born during the pseudoglandular phase or in the early canalicular phase, when we know that now the baby cannot survive. Right, so that is the circular stage of lung development. Now the final stage, which we call the alveolar stage of lung development. In the alveolar stage of lung development, as the name suggests, we have formation, expansion, and thinning of the alveoli. So individual alveoli form, they expand, they become even thinner. The respiratory membrane that was already established continues to become thinner and thinner, just to make sure that gas exchange will be efficient. The surfactant that was, that, that the production had started in the canalicular stage and then circular stage continues to be produced as well. So we have increased secretion of surfactant. And perhaps at this time now, the surfactant amount is actually adequate so that if a baby is born at this time, the baby can survive even without support. As the alveoli continue to increase, the capillaries also increase. Remember that the blood vessels run together with the airways. So this image captures for you the concept of thinning of the airways, the respiratory membrane, or rather, as you can see, becoming much thinner. This is an alveolar duct. These are alveolar sacs and alveoli. We see thinning of the respiratory membrane. In terms of time frame, so if circular stage is from 20, 27 to 36 weeks of gestation. Um, the alveolar stage is from 36 weeks of gestation going 
all the way to even beyond the time of birth. Importantly, that's when you have expansion of the gas exchange areas. So we are significantly increasing the surface area over which gas exchange can take place during the alveolar stage of lung development. I've told you that the face extends postnatally up to around eight years. Uh, I don't want us to go with the 18 written there. Up to eight or nine years, it's usually childhood, basically. However, even though that's happening, much of the events, much of the postnatal events take place within the first two years. Most of the postnatal events take place within the first two years. But yes, there's still others that take place up to the age of eight or nine years, when now there is full maturity of the land. It is said that about 50 million alveoli are formed before birth. Yet, by the time the lung is fully mature, the lung has about 300 million alveoli. What does that tell you? That the number of alveoli that form after birth of the baby are much more than the number of alveoli that form before birth of the baby. That's the statement. So the postnatal stage of lung development becomes therefore very key because at the time that like over five over six of the alveoli are actually formed. If you are to make this in the form of a fraction, only one over six will form before birth. Then five over six of the total number of alveoli will form after birth. Good, so those are the stages of lung development. We've captured for you one by one, embryonic, stidoglandular, canalicular, circular, and the alveolar stage, and the events that take place in each. The second image just captures for you that one together with the gestational period. But also importantly, I want you to understand that uh, the stages somehow overlap, as you can see, the embryonic stage is going on and the pseudoglandular has already begun. So there's some degree of overlap. Again, if you see that, understand that's actually okay, that there's some degree of overlap. So you don't have a sharp ending and an abrupt beginning of each of the phases. So that's what I want you to understand from that particular slide. This particular table help us to capture the time period. I told you that some books will use different timings. And so again, try to understand, remember the other book was talking about 26 weeks and this is talking about 28 weeks. It's okay. We understand that there's some overlap as well, but understand the key period basically, and also understand the key events. So during the embryonic stage, in terms of the morphological structure that appear, the trachea and the major bronchi. In the pseudoglandular stage, we have formation of the remaining conducting zone. So from generation two to generation 16. In the canalicular stage, the blood vessels increase tremendously, but we also have formation of the asinus. The asinus from histological perspective refers to that portion distal to the terminal bronchial. And so put in a different way, the sinus refers to the gas exchange unit of the lungs or what we call the functional unit of the lung, the respiratory zone of the lung. That is what we call the sinus, respiratory zone of the lung. So from the canalicular stage, that's where the respiratory zones are forming because the others were largely conducting airways. So from canalicular stage, we have formation of the respiratory zone. Yes, the epithelium will continue to become thin as you go all the way until maturity. Let's talk about the fetal lung fluid. There's some water that is present in the lung throughout pregnancy that water largely come from 
the pulmonary epithelial cells. So those epithelial cells that line the lung, so largely the endoderm that is in the lung is the one that is producing this water. If you compare the pressure of the water in the lungs and the pressure of the amniotic fluid, we notice that the pressure of the water in the lungs is slightly higher than that of the amniotic fluid. And so because of that, this net efflux of the lung fluid from the lung alveoli to the amniotic fluid, there is net efflux. Because of that net efflux, it means that surfactant therefore can move from the lung to the amniotic fluid because of that net efflux. The presence of surfactant in the amniotic fluid forms the basis of us doing what we call amniotic fluid analysis. When we want to check the amount of surfactant in the amniotic fluid. And why do you want to do so? We want to determine fetal lung maturity. The amount of surfactant within the amniotic fluid tells us much about whether the fetal lung is actually mature. And if the baby is born at that time, they are able to survive on their own or not. That fluid that is usually within the lung begin to be removed before delivery, but also continues several hours after the baby has been born. The primary mechanism of that fluid being removed is not really squeezing out and the baby coughing, but more of the fluid being absorbed into the pulmonary circulation, especially because pulmonary circulation become very significant postnatally and also by the lymphatic vessels within the lungs. Those ones also contribute to clearance of the lung fetal fluid. If that fluid is cleared slowly, if you have delayed clearance of that fluid, there could be a problem, usually present in a few newborns. We call that transplant tachypnea of the newborn. We see this more in babies who have been born through cesarean section rather than through vaginal delivery. But yes, it can happen even in babies who have been born through vaginal delivery. There's some fetal shunts. Fetal shunts are mechanisms of redirecting blood away from particular regions. There are three fetal shunts. You'll talk about this more when you look at development of the cardiovascular system. But let me just put it because it is important as we talk about the lungs. There are some regions that blood doesn't go or blood is redirected in the fetus. And those are the ones we call the fetal shunts. There are three of them. One is called the ductus venosus. When blood comes from the placenta, it goes through the umbilical vein. That blood is well oxygenated. But the umbilical vein goes to the liver. If that blood was to be delivered in the liver wholly, you will compromise on the levels of oxygen of that blood. And so there's a channel within the liver that takes that blood through the liver to the inferior vena cava. That channel is what we call the ductus venosus. So it shunts oxygenated blood from the umbilical vein to the inferior vena cava. The aim is to avoid the circulation within the liver. The second shunt, and those second and the third one, the ones which are of importance in the particular lecture, the second shunt is what we call the foramen ovale. Foramen ovale is a gap between the right atrium and the left atrium. That shunt takes well oxygenated stream of blood from the right atrium to the left atrium. Because of that, it bypasses the pulmonary circulation. So the statement I'm making is that even though the fetal lung is developing, the blood flow to the fetal lung is not that as high compared to what happens postnatally. We don't have a functional pulmonary circulation during pregnancy. And so there's a way in which the blood that usually goes to the lung is redirected away from the lung. Two mechanisms help to redirect that blood. One is foramen ovale, which takes 
well oxygenated blood from the right atrium to the left atrium. And the second one is what we call the ductus arteriosus, which takes poorly oxygenated blood from the pulmonary trunk to the outer. Now understand why they need to be two instead of just one. One carries oxygenated blood and the other one carries predominantly deoxygenated blood. Why are those two streams not allowed to mix at this point? When oxygenated blood comes this way, follow with me from the umbilical vein, that is well oxygenated stream of blood. There's a shunt there, ductus venosus, now inferior vena cava. That blood goes to the right atrium, then to the left atrium. It is well oxygenated. It goes to the left ventricle, then it's pumped to the aorta. What do you notice? When it's pumped to the aorta, there's some privileged organs which are going to receive that well oxygenated blood. The first one is the heart because it's applied by the ascending aorta. The second one is the brain because it's supplied by the branches of the aortic arch. And the third one is the thyroid gland, again, supplied by the branches of the aortic arch. So those three organs are privileged. They receive high levels of oxygen. The fourth organ that receives high levels of oxygen is the liver itself. I think in this diagram, you can see that even though you have the ductus venosus as a shunt, there's some blood that also just goes to the liver direct. So the liver is also privileged to receive high levels of oxygen. Only after the brain has received high levels of oxygen that this other deoxygenated blood, look at this one, the blood from the superior vena cava enters the right atrium, then goes to the right ventricle, is the one that is pumped to the pulmonary trunk that blood is poor in oxygen. When it comes like that, that blood again, if it was left there, it will go to the lungs, but you don't want it to go to the lungs. So it's shunted to the outer through the ductus arteriosus. Notice that the ductus arteriosus joins the outer after the outer has already supplied the privileged organs. So that is why the two shunts need to be there to make sure that the privileged organs receive high levels of oxygen. So anyway, take a message. The fetal lung does not have a functional pulmonary circulation. There are mechanisms of ensuring that the fetal lung does not have significant blood flow. Those mechanisms are called fetal shards. Two of them, are important to bypass blood away from the lungs, to redirect blood away from the lungs, foramen ovale and ductus arteriosus. But for the sake of completion, I've also put for you ductus venosa so that you know that there are three fetal shots. Now that's good. We now want to do the last part of the lecture. And that is basically talking about congenital malformations of the respiratory system. That will also take us a little long but uh, I know you are ready for it. So let's look at the malformations. Usually the malformations of the respiratory system can be classified into different, uh, using different uh, bases. However, there's no good consensus of how they're classified. And some people emphasize on some things. There are those classifications that uh, emphasize on the embryological basis of them. There's some classification that emphasize on the radiological appearance of the malformations. There's some classification that emphasize on the pathological sequences that to take place. And there's some classification that emphasize on clinical picture. And so you realize that depending on who you are, you can actually choose to classify them in a particular way. I chose not to take a bias. And so I'll just give you the malformations without classifying for you. I'll show you quite a number of malformations of the respiratory system. <clears throat> 
and we'll be discussing them. The first one is shown here. In this malformation, we're looking at the second image. We see something separating the nasal cavity and the nasopharynx. It's a bony structure. The first one is normal. Remember the junction between the nose and the nasopharynx is called the coana. In the third and the fourth image, these are axial CT scans of children at the level of the nasal airway and nasopharynx. And what we notice is some soft tissue. Now these ones are not bony. Bone is really bright on CT. The soft tissue, that one, that one. And this one is a thicker soft tissue. It's not bone, but it's very thick soft tissue compared to this one, which is thin. Either way, we see that these soft tissues are separating the nasal airway from the nasopharynx. They're located at the level of the corona. So this baby and this baby have blockage of the corona. That's what we call coronal atresia. So coronal atresia can take place. It's not a good thing because this baby will find it difficult to breathe. You can imagine they have to breathe through their mouth. Something you may not know is that a newborn baby is an obligate nasal breather. They don't know how to breathe through their mouth. And that is where these babies will really struggle, even to the point of death, if they are born with coronal atresia. But can be managed especially if picked much early. This second one, you are unlikely to come across it unless you are a radiologist. The reason is because this second one is not compatible with postnatal life, but we see it in some pregnancies. We call it congenital high airway obstruction syndrome, or we just call it chaos. Chaos take place if you have atresia at the level of the larynx or at the level of the trachea. You've affected the central airways. If you affect the central airways, the lungs will not develop because there's no way fluid will be entering or leaving the lung. And that fluid movement into a lot of the lung is very important for lung development and expansion of the lung alveoli. You see, if a child has coronal atresia, at least there's still a mouth and oropharynx. So through that route, fluid can still enter and leave the lung. And so coronal atresia, the baby will be born alive. But if there is atresia at the level of the trachea or at the level of the larynx, there's no way the lung will receive some communication with the amniotic fluid. So the lung will be underdeveloped. Now that will come in form of a syndrome. Many things happen. In this particular first and second image, MRI image, I don't think you'll be understanding much there. But let's look at the second, the third image, which is an ultrasound image of a baby during pregnancy. So the probe is somewhere there. This is the anterior abdominal wall of the mother. And this is the anterior layer of the uterus. And now from here, today is the placenta. So this placenta is anterior. This is the baby. This is the head of the baby. That's the neck of the baby. This is the thorax. And what do you see in the thorax? This is the lung, that bright one is the lung, that's the heart, and uh, this is the level of the diaphragm, and this is abdomen basically, with a lot of fluid in the abdomen. When we have chaos, the, the pressure in the lungs becomes so much, because I told the pressure usually allow fluid to move out. So if you have chaos, the pressure in the lung becomes so much, the diaphragm becomes averted. You look at the control of the diaphragm, it's now not dumb on the upper part, but dumb on the lower end and there's a lot of fluid accumulation, these babies usually die prenatally. It's a little malformation. Now, this other one you're likely to come across often, 
esophageal atresia and stroke or tachyesophageal fistula. These ones occur <clears throat> due to failure of formation of the tubular esophagus. That is what we call esophageal atresia. Let me put it this way. Esophagus is a luminous structure. It's a tubular structure. When the lumen of the esophagus is not continuous for whatever reason, that now food cannot move through the esophagus all the way to the stomach, there's some blockage somewhere. That is what we call atresia. If there is no luminal continuity to the stomach, we call that esophageal atresia. It can happen on its own, but it can also happen with abnormal communication between the trachea and the esophagus. And that is what we call tracheoesophageal fistula. So tracheoesophageal fistula is abnormal communication between the trachea and the esophagus. Esophageal atresia is the lack of tubular lumen continuity of the esophagus. Those two malformations can occur individually, but they can also occur together. And that is why I'm putting that long name. But for the sake of clinical consumption, we usually just call this one tracheoesophageal fistula. It occurs due to abnormal forgot septation. So it's one of the malformations due to abnormal forgot septation. There are different varieties of uh, TOF. They can also occur as part of a syndrome. So you have a child has a TOF, but there's also other malformations. And the commonest association of malformations is this one which we call <clears throat> the Vactrel association of malformation. So the V there stands for vertebral malformations. A there stands for anorectal malformations. C for cardiac malformations. T and E for trachea and esophageal malformations. So this is where the TOF come in. R for renal malformations and L for limb malformations. Babies with TOF may have TOF on its own, but they may also have other malformations and that become an association of malformation. The Bactrel association of malformation is the commonest one that has been described. I'll show you different types of TOF. So there are five types of TOF. I'm just calling them TOF. But remember that long name is the most accurate one. But for clinical consumption, just call them tracheoesophageal fistula, TOF. So there are five types of TOF. I want us to go through each of the type and you to understand what each type mean clinically. The first one, type A, tracheoesophageal fistula. In type A, tracheoesophageal fistula, we see that the trachea is okay, but there's something abnormal with the esophagus. The esophagus is atretic. There is lack of tubular lumen continuity. So in type A, tracheoesophageal fistula, we are talking about esophageal atresia without tracheoesophageal fistula. That is type A. How will this baby present? There's nothing wrong so much with the breathing of the baby, but the trouble comes when this baby is breastfeeding. This baby cannot breastfeed. When they suckle the breast milk, the milk just comes back. They regurgitate the milk. Even if they're not breastfeeding, remember usually you have a lot of saliva secretion in your mouth, and even the babies do we continuously swallow saliva that we produce. This baby will not be able to swallow the saliva. So there'll be a lot of secretions in the mouth of this particular baby, just be frothing most of the time. 
In clinical setup, when a baby is not able to breastfeed, there's some clinical attempt that will be made. One of them is to insert a tube through the nose of the child all the way to the stomach. We call that nasogastric tube. When you put such a tube, the tube will not pass through there. So the tube will not go in. That is what will help you to make a clinical diagnosis of uh, esophageal atresia, at least. Inability to breastfeed with regurgitation, secretions in the mouth, and failure of NG tube to go down. Second one, look at that second one. We see that there's lack of tubular lumen continuity of the esophagus. So there is esophageal atresia. But there is also another problem. The esophagus and the trachea are communicating. On which side? On the proximal segment of the esophagus. So we call this one esophageal atresia with proximal tracheoesophageal fistula. It's rather rare. But there. So this child, how will this child present clinically? In addition to the frothing, inability to breastfeed, there's one critical thing that will be happening here, which is not happening here. If this child breastfeeds, this child will choke. The risk of choking is very high because milk may go to the lungs. So this become very dangerous compared to that one. How about type C, tracheoesophageal fistula? Again, we notice that there is esophageal atresia, but there is also a fistula. The fistula in this time is distal. This is the most common TOF type that you are going to see. Tracheoesophageal Fistula type C is the most common type of TOF. It is esophageal atresia with a distal tracheoesophageal fistula. How will you distinguish this baby from this baby? The clinical presentation that this baby had that we highlighted, those three are also present here, all of them. But there's an addition here. In this particular child, as they breathe, air goes to the stomach. And so there'll be distension of the abdomen. And when you do take a radiograph of the abdomen, we are going to see a lot of gas in the abdomen. While in this child, when you take a radiograph of the abdomen, we are not going to see any gas in the abdomen. The abdomen of this baby will be gasless. The abdomen of this baby will be full of gas. That's how we make the difference between the two radiologically. Of course, there are other ways that we do, but that's one of them. Remember type C, TOF, is the most common type of TOF. Type four is uh, esophageal atresia with both proximal and distal tract esophageal fistula. You can figure out how they clinically present, basically an amalgamation between this one and the other one. Type E tracheoesophageal fistula is basically tracheoesophageal fistula without esophageal atresia. We call it the H type. Good. Having seen all those five types of TOF, I want you people to use the chart and just write which type between A, B, C and D, A, B, C, D and E, which type is actually the one that will be diagnosed late? Is it type A, type B, type C, type D or type E? Which one will present last clinically? All right, good. I can see people get it right. So type E definitely will present late. And usually we diagnose type E maybe in the second year of life, sometimes third or fourth year of life. 
but these are the ones you definitely diagnose them at birth. So the other types you will have to diagnose them at the time of birth, but this other one is diagnosed much later. I've seen someone asking what's a fistula. A fistula is an abnormal communication between two epithelial surfaces. An abnormal communication between two epithelial surfaces. That's what you call a fistula. It made an assumption that from previous lectures, we define what a fistula, what a sinus, and what a cyst. When you talk about urethral malformations, we discuss them. Vital duct malformations, we discuss them in our basic embryology series. So I made an assumption, but fine. A fistula is an abnormal communication between two epithelial surfaces. A sinus is an abnormal tract with a blind end. A cyst is an abnormal cavity with no drainage. So it's an enclosed cavity. So here we're talking about a fistula, abnormal communication between the trachea and the esophagus. The term atresia means blocked or lack of tubular lumen continuity. So like this is an atresia, that's an atresia, that's atresia, that's atresia, but this one, there's no atresia. All right, that is TOF. This next one shows us a narrowing of the trachea. The term we use for narrowing is stenosis. So we call this one tracheal stenosis. Tracheal stenosis is an abnormal narrowing of the tracheal lumen. The stenosis may be caused by the presence of a focal or diffuse complete cartilage rings around the trachea. Remember the trachea usually has C-shaped cartilage rings, but some regions of the trachea in this particular babies may have a complete cartilage ring. So that becomes a point of narrowing. But there's also another cause of uh, tracheal stenosis. If uh, during fog acceptation, there is this proportionate growth of the esophagus at the expense of the trachea. So the esophagus become significantly large, but the trachea become tiny. That will give you a generally narrow trachea throughout the length, not this focal narrowing, but uh, throughout the whole length of the trachea to be narrow. So those are the causes of tracheal stenosis. And this next one shows us what we call tracheomalacia. Tracheomalacia is a condition where the tracheal wall is soft because of the abnormality of the cartilage within the trachea. So the cartilage of the trachea is soft because it's not mature. Because of that, when this baby breathes, the trachea will be collapsing. Look at the change in shape of the trachea during inhalation and exhalation. The, the trachea will be collapsing as the baby is breathing in and out. We call that tracheomalacia. It's largely because of immature cartilage within the trachea. This next one shows us a bronchus that arises from the trachea. You see this, the trachea, and so that's the carina with the right <clears throat> main stem bronchus and the left main stem bronchus, also reconstructed in that one. Then there's that abnormal bronchus arising from the trachea. We just call it tracheal bronchus, nothing much about it uh, clinically. But yes, yes, it's an embryological anomaly. So we talk about it. This next one shows us a very common lesion. We call it bronchogenic cysts. <clears throat> so this is an axial CT scan at the level of the thorax, emphasizing on the structures of the mediastinum. So we call it mediastinal window. The black you see here, represents the regions where the lungs are. So these bright ones are blood vessels that are sending out, that's descending out. This is the superior vena cover. 
and this is the main pulmonary artery with the left pulmonary artery there, the right one becoming somewhere like this. Now there's this abnormal mass of tissue there that you see in the mediastinum abutting the, the right lung. This is the right lung, this is the left lung. So this one is what you call bronchogenic cyst. Bronchogenic cyst formed due to abnormal budding of the foregut. When the foregut was forming and we have the bronchial tree arising, you could have some abnormal body, either because you had some extra uh, diverticulum forming, but again, they don't end up forming a lung, or just from the trachobronchial tree, there's some budding off, which are abnormal. Those abnormal budding disconnect from the main airway and they become cysts. These cysts are usually containing mucus, underlined by ciliated columnar epithelium or ciliated cuboidal epithelium. The masses, okay, maybe that is an S, the masses may be mediastinal or they may be found within the, most of the time they're within the mediastinal. This is the region we call the mediastinal, but sometimes they could be actually inside the lung or they could even be in the neck or they could be in the abdomen, but mostly they're mediastinal masses. Usually these masses don't communicate with the major airway. And so their big trouble is just pressure symptoms. Depending on where they are, they could be compressing the left recurrent laryngeal nerve, or the right recurrent laryngeal nerve. They could be compressing the trachea, the esophagus, you know, whatever they compress, just pressure symptoms. They can be compressing some nerves. However, they could get infected and then they make communication with the tracheobronchial tree, and that becomes now kind of an emergency. This next malformation show you the trachea there with the two mainstem bronchi, and so that a lobar bronchus, that's another lobar bronchus. Then there's another bronchus going there, so that's a segmental bronchus. And we see some discontinuity there because of blockage. We call that bronchial atresia. A blockage of a bronchus is called bronchial atresia. So bronchial atresia is focal obliteration of a bronchus. Most of the time it will affect a segmental bronchus, but can also involve a lobar bronchus. When you have bronchial atresia, this is what happens. So if there is blockage there, the segment of the bronchus distal to the blockage become filled with mucus. And that region has no communication with the rest of the central airway. So air cannot go there. That bronchus become filled with mucus. Commonly, it will affect the upper low bronchi and especially the left one. So we see it more in the left upper low bronchi. We call that bronchial atresia. This other radiograph shows, um, you see black means air and that means lung. So we see the left lung is very big and has even crossed the midline. We don't see the right lung. The structures which are usually in the mediastinum have been displaced to the right side. We call that mediastinal shift. The outline of the trachea, look at that one. It's off the midline because of the mediastinal shift. So something has happened to the right lung. And so the left lung has expanded to push the mediastinal structures to the right. What has happened here is that we actually don't have the right lung. We call that pulmonary agenesis. If a lung does not form completely, we call that pulmonary agenesis. Bilateral pulmonary agenesis is not compatible with life, but unilateral pulmonary agenesis is compatible with life. And this is actually an adult rather than a child. So it occurs due to unilateral absence of the mainstem bronchus. And that means even the corresponding lung. 
And this could happen because of vascular insult sometimes. So there is something that destroys the mainstem bronchus, could be vascular insult. It could also be because of failure of induction so that there was no lung bud formation on one side. Or it started to form, then the development becomes arrested for whatever molecular reasons. So whatever happens, there is destruction, or rather there is no lung. We call that pulmonary agenesis. If one lung does not form, the lung that forms will have to compensate by becoming bigger, and so it will appear to even herniate to cross the midline to the other side. Just compensatory hypertrophy. In this next one, we see left lung there, but this also right lung. So this is not pulmonary agenesis, but yes, we can still see mediastinal shift. But important, you see this large region containing lung tissue, and that's most likely the one that's causing the mediastinal shift. We call this one congenital lobar hyperinflation. It's as a result of the presence of a check valve mechanism that is present within a particular bronchus. Let's say it's lobar bronchus. So this lobar bronchus has a valve that allows air to pass through from the atmosphere to the lung, but does not allow air to pass from the lung back to the atmosphere. It's a valve. So it allowing only unidirectional movement of air. So what happened? As this baby grows, continues, continuously we have progressive air trapping. Air is being trapped within the lobe of a lung. And that will gradually cause that particular lobe that is affected to be distending progressively. That is why we call it hyperinflation. So usually affecting a lobe rather than a whole lung, we call it congenital lobar hyperinflation. Uh, it has also been called infantile lobar emphysema or congenital lobar emphysema. So notice this one, we are not going to pick at birth. This baby must have grown some days or weeks and then now you notice that there is some mediastinal shifting. They are breathing funny. When you take a radiograph, then we see that one. Because you make the diagnosis based on the trapping, and the trapping cannot have taken place before birth. So yes, the anomaly was there or has developed, but the clinical presentation cannot be at birth to be a few days to allow for air trapping. And the more the baby lives, the more the air trapping will be worsening. This next one shows uh, a lung that is underdeveloped in a post-mortem uh, specimen. This baby did not survive. So look at those lungs, very tiny, that's the heart. So underdeveloped lungs is basically called pulmonary hypoplasia, under development of a lung. So it occurs due to deficient or incomplete development of a lung, and the causes of incomplete or deficient development of a lung could be many. Common ones are these three. There is a compromise in the blood flow to that particular lung, either bilaterally or unilaterally, mostly bilaterally. So there's a compromise either because of the main pulmonary arteries, there's something that's compromising blood flow to lung. So that lung is not well vascularized. Or there is uh, no usual inhalation or intake of the amniotic fluid. And this could be largely because of oligohydramnios. So in situations of oligohydramnios, we also expect pulmonary hypoplasia. And when oligodermance is characterized by pulmonary hypoplasia, that's a bad sign. 
essentially occurring much earlier, it's a bad sign. The other factor is if there is no adequate space for the lungs to expand for whatever reason. Maybe there is a hernia in the diaphragm, so abdominal organs are in the thorax, so there's no enough space for the lungs to expand. Or maybe there's some malformations that we're going to talk about, pulmonary sequestration, so the rest of the normal lung is small. Or there's a large bronchogenic cyst, Whatever is compromising the available space for lung expansion will cause pulmonary hypoplasia. Important to note that is in pulmonary hypoplasia, the bronchi and the alveoli are actually present, except they are underdeveloped, but they're present. This next one is what you're calling bronchopulmonary sequestration. You can just call it pulmonary sequestration or lung sequestration. Lung sequestration is a concept describing the presence of an unfunctioning mass of lung tissue. There's lung tissue in the thorax, but it's not functional. And why is it not functional? Because it is not connected to the main airway. It is not connected to the central airway. So air does not go to that lung tissue. If you have a lung tissue that is not connected to the airway, that lung tissue is a sequestered lung tissue. That's what you call pulmonary sequestration. In pulmonary sequestration, the abnormal lung tissue does not receive pulmonary arteries. So I mean, it does not receive deoxygenated blood from the right chambers of the heart. In contrast, it receives oxygenated blood from the systemic circulation. Now that's how we pick it. In this image, you can see that or that one. So it's connected to the systemic circulation rather than to the pulmonary circulation. There are two types of bronchopulmonary sequestration. There's what you call extra lobar pulmonary sequestration where the abnormal lung tissue has its own pleura separate from the rest of the lung. The intralobar pulmonary sequestration does not have a separate pleura. And so the sequestered lung is actually within a normal lobe. Those are the two types of bronchopulmonary sequestration. This next one shows what we call, okay, let me describe it first for you. We call it CPAM, but let me describe it for you first. So in this axial CT scan of the thorax, this one has been emphasized to show the lung characteristics. So we call it lung window. This is the right lung with the left lung. In the left lung, we see some cystic dilatations within the lung. So usually this occurs as a result of abnormal proliferation at the end of the terminal bronchial. So what is happening is that, yes, the pseudoglandular stage was OK, and perhaps the canalicular stage was fine. But beyond that one, starting with the circular stage on part of canalicular anyway, there's a problem. From the time of formation of the respiratory bronchioles, there's a problem so that we are affecting the assigners. The functional unit of the lung is the one that's affected here. It is scattered by the presence of cysts, which can be tiny or big, and they're lined by column epithelium, cubital epithelium. They don't have alveoli. These cysts don't have alveoli. We call this one CPAM, which stands for congenital pulmonary airway malformation. The cysts that we see, usually communicate with an abnormal bronchial tree, but that bronchial tree also usually lack cartilage. Formerly, this was called cystic adenomatoid malformation of the lung. We no longer use that term, so we prefer calling it congenital pulmonary airway malformation. A bit rare, but very characteristic when you see one. 
This next one shows an abnormal contour of the left pulmonary artery. When the main pulmonary artery comes like this, it should divide into right pulmonary artery and left pulmonary artery. And the left pulmonary artery should be in front of the trachea. However, in this one, the left pulmonary artery is behind the trachea, between the trachea and the esophagus. We call it pulmonary artery sling. In pulmonary artery sling, the left pulmonary artery arises from the posterior aspect of the right pulmonary artery. You know, this left one should have come from here, but not arising from here. So it's basically arising from the posterior aspect of the right pulmonary artery. And so because of that, it takes an abnormal route between the trachea and the esophagus. In terms of the basis, it is believed that perhaps the main artery there, the sixth arch artery involuted, remember the sixth arch artery is the one that gives us the pulmonary artery. So maybe the left sixth arch artery involuted. And so to compensate, there's another artery that forms from the right six arch artery that curves in that particular manner to compensate. It will form a sling around the trachea and the esophagus and usually, sorry, around the trachea and sometimes around the right main bronchus. And so it can cause narrowing of those structures. But remember esophagus also collapsible. And so in that image, you can see that the esophagus also narrowed as well. In terms of symptomatology, there'll be symptomatology concerning stenotic manifestations, basically. The radio, sorry, the chest CT scan we're seeing here is showing us that this is the ascending outer and this is the descending outer. This is the main pulmonary artery. So this is the right pulmonary artery. We expect the left one to have come from here, but it's not coming from there. So we see the left one coming from the right pulmonary artery, then curving between the trachea that and esophagus is somewhere here, it's just collapsed. So that is the pulmonary artery sling. This next one is what we call partial anomalous pulmonary venous return. You can call it partial anomalous pulmonary venous connection. It is where we have uh, one or more pulmonary veins, but not all pulmonary veins, one or more pulmonary veins, returning blood not to the left atrium, but to the systemic circulation. In the first image that is normal, the pulmonary veins need to take blood back to the left atrium. So the right superior, right inferior, left superior, left inferior pulmonary veins take blood to the left atrium. Remember that blood is oxygenated. In this malformation, we see one of the pulmonary veins, and in this case, we've taken the right superior pulmonary vein, taking blood to the superior vena cava. Oxygenated blood is joining the deoxygenated blood. When we look at malformations of the cardiovascular system, we are going to call that one a left to right shunt. And we'll explain later why it's called a left to right shunt. Typically, the abnormal pulmonary vein will be taking blood to systemic vessels, could be superior vena cava, could be inferior vena cava, could be the azygous vena system, or the left innominate vein. The left innominate vein refers to the left brachycephalic vein. The most common type is where we have the right upper lobe pulmonary vein draining to the superior vena cava as shown in that particular image, but you can have any of them. So we call that partial anomalous pulmonary venous return or partial anomalous pulmonary venous connection. Remember, not all the four are affected. If all the four are affected, then we call it total anomalous pulmonary venous return. And the diagnosis changes completely even clinical presentation changes. This one could be asymptomatic, this malformation here. But total anomalous pulmonary venous connection is definitely symptomatic. The baby will turn blue at the time of birth, and that baby is at the risk of not surviving very high, high mortality rate. Total anomalous pulmonary venous connection means that 
all the four pulmonary veins take blood to the systemic circulation as opposed to the left atrium. And so that baby will have another kind of shunting that you're going to call a right to left shunt. We'll discuss that when you look at malformations of the cardiovascular system that I'll be taking you shortly. Okay, another time, not today, of course. Something important to know for you, even though it's not morphological, but a common thing, and I want you to know it. Some babies could be born prematurely. If a baby is born prematurely, they may not have adequate amount of surfactant within their lungs to facilitate lung expansion. So those babies will be having collapsed alveoli. When they are born, their alveoli do not expand adequately. And so they have difficulty in gas exchange. They'll present with respiratory distress. We call that respiratory distress syndrome of the newborn. Now that's a clinical diagnosis. We sometimes call it the surfactant deficiency syndrome, and that's the commonest term being used um, in the common in the new medicine. Surfactant deficiency syndrome. From a pathological perspective, the alveoli usually collapse and they form some material that is uniform, covering the alveoli that collapse with some material accumulation, and so pathologists call it hyaline membrane disease. I will not discuss the radiographs, maybe because you not understand much about them, but all those three are three children with that syndrome of hyaline membrane disease. I'll give you an assignment because we can't do this one. We, the topic was the respiratory system and we've done that really well, but I'll give you some assignments. You don't have lectures for this, and so I want you to check on them. One of them is to just look at the embryonic sources and sequence of development of the thoracic diaphragm. So do that at your own time. But I'll give you malformations related to the diaphragm. Two of them I'm going to give you. One, we have congenital diaphragmatic hernia. Congenital diaphragmatic hernia is where you have a defect in the thoracic diaphragm. And because of the presence of that defect, variable abdominal organs can move through that defect to the thorax, stomach, omentum, intestines, liver, can go through the defect to go to the thorax. So we call that congenital diaphragmatic hernia. You may have different types of hernia, anterior hernias, posterior hernias. They have some funny names, uh, Bogdalek and Mugagni and the like, you can check on them. Important to note is that uh, if there is a diaphragmatic hernia, the space available for the lung is compromised, and so that baby may have pulmonary hypoplasia. The other one that I want to talk about is what we call eventration of the thoracic diaphragm. In eventration of the thoracic diaphragm, we have abnormal contour of one of the hemidiaphragm. The reason is because of incomplete muscularization of the hemidiaphragm. In this particular image, we see that contour and that contour. So the left hemidiaphragm in this particular child is the problem. And the problem is that it doesn't have muscles. It has a thin membrane here, but it's very weak. And so with the time as this baby breathes, this continue to just stretch upwards like that. And so compromising on the size available for the left lung, this also gives you pulmonary hypoplasia. Abdominal organs will be going up. Now this is not herniation because there's no defect through the diaphragm. There is still separation between thoracic and abdominal organs, but uh, it has just gone up because it's weak. It can't maintain the abdominal organs down. That is, the ventration of the thoracic diaphragm. Second assignment is to read on development of the ventral body wall. So that means the anterior chest wall, as well as the anterior abdominal wall. And you'll explain the malformations related to those two, anterior body wall and, okay, anterior chest wall and anterior abdominal wall. 
I'll however give you the list of malformations that affect the ventral body wall. Gastroschisis, omphalocele, those one we are going to talk about again when you look at development of the digestive system. The third one, body stock anomaly, limb body wall complex, pentalogy of Cantrell, those ones we are unlikely to talk about again, so we'll check on them. Prune belly syndrome, we may talk about when we look at the uh, GIT development as well. Ectopia cordis, you'll talk about when you look at development of the cardiovascular system. And the other two, you'll talk about when you look at development of the urogenital system. These ones are malformations that affect the ventral body wall. All right, now we are truly done with malformations, development and malformations of the respiratory tree. I told you that the anomalies are many and that's why I wanted to give that break. I'm glad we're done. Now we'll stop there. Thank you very much.